This is Bible warfare, how to defend your faith, lesson number three in the series. Miscellaneous questions about baptism and forgiveness. So each lesson in the series on how to defend your faith begins with a reminder of the rules of engagement. Won't spend too much time on this, of course. We've already been through it a couple of times. Respect other people's sincerity even if you disagree with their beliefs, number one. Number two, stick to the Bible and what it says about the issue you may be discussing. You have no better position in discussing matters uh, of religion as when you say in Romans chapter eight or in Matthew chapter four, you know, if, if you begin like that and, and you start off with a scripture, the discussion is going to go uh, so much more smoothly, most of the time anyways. Uh, and also be patient. It takes time for people to change their minds about things in general, but especially about religious matters. They're, they're things of the soul, they're eternal matters. You know? So as I mentioned last week, uh, the questions that you asked, uh, I've divided them up into four categories, try to answer from one each week. Four categories were doctrinal questions, questions about evangelism, Bible facts and various miscellaneous questions uh, about religion in general or practice in general. All right, so we're going to do some doctrinal questions uh, tonight, um, two or three about uh, baptism. So we begin with the first one, what scripture would best show that water baptism is necessary for salvation, contrary to the evangelical belief that uh, belief only or belief in one's heart is the only thing that is necessary. There are two parts in this question uh, that we can supply information for. The first, uh, the first one, the first part, I'm going to re, you know, regroup the question. Um, what scripture best shows that baptism is necessary for salvation? So that's one question that's inherent in this, this larger question that was asked. Well, the answer to that, I mean, where do you begin? There's so many that it's hard to just pick one. I would suggest that when you discuss baptism with someone, especially someone who's a Baptist or Pentecostal, has that kind of background, evangelical background, remember what they believe about baptism. You have to understand what they believe about baptism. They believe that there are still several types of baptism available today. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, which, which is, by the way, a misnomer. The term baptism of the Holy Spirit does not appear in the New Testament. Not one time. It's baptism with the Holy Spirit, and there's a big difference, and I'll show you in a moment. Uh, baptism by fire and baptism in water. They also believe that the exact point of salvation is the moment that you make the intellectual decision to believe in Jesus. Everything after that is simply a ritual to explain or to commemorate the completed salvation. For example, when you ask them what do they think about baptism, usually the answer will be, well, baptism is an outward sign that expresses an inward and complete reality. It's just symbolic. Some Baptists believe that once you are saved, your baptism is your initiation right into the local you know, Baptist church. Okay, so listening and understanding someone else's religion's uh, beliefs is part of the respect necessary to keep the communication flowing. It's good that you understand what they believe. The next step is to to stick to the Bible. So what does the Bible say about this subject? Well, the Bible teaches that there is only one baptism remaining for the church to preach today. You start there. There are not three or four or five baptisms. There's only one. Paul teaches, and then here's where, you know, it's good to have that open Bible. Paul teaches that there's only one faith, right? In Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, there's only one body and one spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all 
and through all and in all. So can we, you know, can we mangle the scripture to, to make it say that there are actually four baptisms or two baptisms? No, it says there's only, there's only one body. Well, yes, we agree with that. One spirit, is there more than one Holy Spirit? No, it's only one Holy Spirit. Uh, and so on and so forth. So one faith, one baptism. That's what Ephesians teaches. So which is it? Is it, is it the baptism you know, with or of the Holy Spirit? The baptism of fire, water? Well, let's read another passage, Matthew 3.11. John the Baptist, it says, as for me, I baptize you uh, with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals, he will baptize you, did you notice here, it doesn't say of the Holy Spirit, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the baptism with the Holy Spirit was given by Jesus to his apostles on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter one, verse four and five, Luke writes, gathering them together, this is Jesus, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So there's Jesus promising that they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Who's making the promise? Jesus. Who's he making the promise to? The apostles, right? Okay, watch the fulfillment. Acts chapter two, verses one and two. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. This baptism was promised only to the apostles by Jesus, we, we read the passage, and it was received by them at Pentecost, and it was their empowering to do the miracles necessary to confirm the gospel of Christ and their witness of the resurrection. How do we know that it was a baptism of empowering? Well, they began to speak in other tongues. They immediately began to, 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 to do a miracle. And the Greek word there, speaking in other tongues, that Greek word glossa means a language. They began speaking in languages, other languages, languages that they had not learned. So as I say, they demonstrated this power by speaking in foreign languages they had never learned before, a phenomenon known as speaking in tongues. So there's the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It was promised by Jesus, it was promised to the apostles, and then we see the fulfillment of the, pro, uh, of the promise on the Sunday, the day of Pentecost. We, we not only read about it, we see it, we, we see what's happened. So the tongues of fire, a visual sign, the Holy Spirit, and them speaking in tongues, a symbol, not a symbol, but a proof of the empowerment that they, uh, that they received. Now baptism of fire, what is that? Well, baptism of fire is a biblical way of saying a judgment or a testing. Jesus has had many judgments and tests since John pronounced these words. For example, the people who heard Jesus but refused to believe, this was their test. This was their baptism of fire. Jesus himself suffering and the crucifixion, that was his baptism of fire. The Jewish nation was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman armies. This was their judgment by God for refusing their Messiah. This was their baptism of fire. The persecution that the early church suffered, that was their baptism of fire. And then of course the final judgment at the end uh, where our faith will be examined by Christ. That will be our judgment of fire. So all of these are the fire that Jesus brings upon the earth. Just a way of saying a judgment, a test. 
And then there is the baptism by immersion. Remember, we're talking about, you know, many evangelicals believe there are three baptisms. The baptism, they say, of the Holy Spirit, but actually it's with the Holy Spirit. So baptism with the Holy Spirit, baptism of fire, I've just demonstrated here, baptism with the Spirit, the apostles got that. Baptism with fire, different people have received the baptism of fire and even we today sometimes we, we receive a baptism of fire when things go wrong when we have problems sick children all of a sudden our spouse die you know those are baptisms of fire and then baptism in water Matthew chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 then Jerusalem was going out to him and all of Judea and all the district around the Jordan and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins baptism in the water Jesus also practiced this baptism in the water therefore when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John although Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples were so this baptism in water, practiced by John the Baptist, practiced by Jesus and the apostles. In Acts chapter two, verse 38, after Peter's sermon, it says, and the, and the crowd said to him, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, they, they've just been told that they you know, murdered their own Messiah. So they're, they're cut to the heart and they say to Peter, okay, what do we do now? And Peter answers, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received His word, another way of saying they believed, were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So the apostles, after Jesus had ascended, after they themselves had received the baptism with the Holy Spirit, began to preach the gospel and the baptism that they were administering to the people who believed was a water baptism. And then of course the church practiced baptism, the early church chapter eight in the book of Acts. The eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road they came to some water and the eunuch said, look water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. So to show you that not only the apostles, but also the others in the early church uh, when they were preaching the gospel, uh, were administering water baptism. Remember, we're talking about uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit, baptism of fire, baptism of water. I've just demonstrated to you that water baptism is the thing that the apostles were doing, the early church was doing, you know, it was water baptism. Now when Paul, some 30 years after Pentecost, 30 years after Pentecost Sunday, Paul the Apostle writes to the Ephesians and he teaches them that there is only one baptism. Which baptism do you think he's telling them about? <laughs> well, he's writing about the one baptism that Jesus practiced and commanded for all who wanted to become his disciples and that is water baptism. How do we know? Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you and lo, I'm with you always till the end of the age. It, does it say uh, and administer a baptism of fire to them here in this passage so that they can become disciples? Does it just say here and make sure they receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit in this? Well, no. He says, make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them, immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. He's teaching them water baptism that they are to administer. One becomes a disciple of Jesus through faith expressed in repentance and immersion in water. That's how Jesus said that they were to do it. And as I read the scriptures from the book of Acts, that's exactly how they did it. They followed his instructions and continued to do so. Even 30 years after Pentecost, Paul is, at, is admonishing them to maintain the one baptism. And so, water baptism is the one baptism that Paul taught about, the one baptism that Peter preached at Pentecost, the one baptism that Jesus commanded be done until the end of time. You, you continue reading all the way to the end of Revelation, you don't see anybody saying, you know what, that water baptism, okay, that we're going to nix that from now on, we're going to go back to some other kind of, no, 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 they're always baptizing people in the water. Baptism with the Holy Spirit was a one-time thing given to the apostles and Cornelius Baptism of fire was a reference to God's judgment and tests, but the one baptism that Paul talks about that all must receive to become Christians is the baptism in water by immersion. That's the answer to that question. Now the second part of this question, what scripture proves that baptism is necessary for salvation? Uh, this question can be answered once the issue of water baptism as the only baptism available has been dealt with. You see, you first have to establish the idea there's only one baptism left. And you begin at Ephesians 4. And once you've established there's only one baptism and then you go through the passages that talk about baptism and just, I mean, look at it in context. What's he talking about? Well, water baptism. How do you know? Well, the eunuch, for example, they went down. He said, look, here's water. Did he say, oh, look, here's fire? No. Oh, look, here's the Holy Spirit. No. He said, hey, here's some water. Can I be baptized? What do you deduce from that? What is the logical conclusion? What kind of baptism did that guy get? Well, he got water baptism. How do you know? <laughs> they both went down into the water. That's how you know. So the key idea here is that in the New Testament, uh, okay, as we go to the next question, all right, the next question, um, what scripture proves that baptism is necessary for salvation? All right, when we go to that question, the key idea here is that in the New Testament, every scripture where baptism is mentioned, it is mentioned in connection with salvation. Every scripture that talks about baptism Baptism is always connected to salvation. Remember, the issue is, is baptism necessary? Do we have to have it in order to complete the process of salvation? So the best way to respond is to simply go through the New Testament and examine what it says about the relationship between baptism and salvation. Now, any one of these scriptures would do but when you string them all together, they're even more effective. So, and I'm, gonna, I'm just using the ones that we're really familiar with here. Let's take six, shall we? You, you, one, one, <laughs> one scripture from, you know, from God's word should be enough. Let's take six, just to make sure. So in Matthew 28, 18, you know, that's the passage where Jesus says, you know, uh, go preach the gospel, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So here's my question. Are disciples saved? If you're a disciple of Jesus, are you saved? Well, yeah. Well, then how did you become a disciple? Well, Matthew 28 says, well, you were baptized. Go make disciples, how? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 16, you know, that's the one where it says, um, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Let's go back to sixth grade uh, grammar, shall we? And, the word and, is a conjunction. And a conjunction, what does a conjunction do? It links two words of equal value. 
of equal value. You know, Johnny and Jimmy went up the hill. Who went up the hill? Well, Johnny went up the hill. Did Jimmy go up the hill? Well, yeah, how do you know? Because there's and there. Johnny and Jimmy went up the hill. And so in Mark 16, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Who are the saved? Well, those who believe. Is that it? Well, believe and, there's that, oh, that nasty conjunction right there, believe and are baptized. Those are the ones who are saved. Baptism always, always in, con, in, conjunct, in conjunction with salvation. It's always connected. John chapter three, verse five, who's going to enter the kingdom? Nicodemus said. Those who are born again of the water and the spirit. There's that conjunction again. So troublesome. Which one? The spirit? Are those the ones? Yeah, born again of the spirit? Well, no, it says the, the water and the spirit. Those are the ones that are uh, saved. Those are the ones that are in the kingdom. Those are the ones that are born again. Isn't it interesting? Then we go to Acts 2.38, right? I've read that one. And Peter says, well, what should we do to be saved? And he said, well, repent. Let every one of you uh, be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then he says, for the forgiveness of sin. And there's another conjunction right there. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the ones who are baptized, what do they get? You will be baptized for, meaning here's what you're going to get, the forgiveness of sins, that's one phrase, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So who are the ones that receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, the ones who are baptized. Who are the ones that receive the forgiveness? Well, the ones who are baptized. How do you know that? Grammar. Not theology, grammar, simple English grammar. Acts twenty-two sixteen. Paul, right, Ananias goes and sees Paul, he preaches the gospel to him, the scales fall from Paul's eyes, Paul now believes in Jesus, he's seen Jesus on the road to Damascus, he's knocked down onto the ground, he, you know, the great light, he hears Jesus, he knows it's Jesus, he's blinded miraculously, he goes, three days later Ananias preaches the gospel to him, Paul believes it miraculously, the scales fall off of his eyes, he's good to go, isn't he? I mean, he's seen Jesus, he's heard Jesus, he's, had, he's been the subject of two miracles, shouldn't he be good to go? And what does Ananias say to him? Saul, why do you delay? Rise up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Oh. <laughs> when were Paul's sins washed away? When he was sitting down blinded? No. How do we know? Because Ananias said to him, what are you waiting for? You've got all of this, you believe. You've even received your mission. <laughs> Jesus told him, you're going to be my witness to the, to, the, uh, to the Gentiles. The guy believes in Jesus, is, experiences a miracle. He even knows what his mission is going to be. And the preacher said to him, okay, now what are you waiting for? You, know, you got all of this, let's go. Be baptized, why? So your sins will be washed away. That's why. Galatians chapter three, verse 26, all those who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Who are the ones that have been clothed with Christ? Well, all those who have been baptized. Have I twisted that scripture? Well, no. All those, he says, who have been buried with Christ, what happens to them? They've put on Christ, which is just another way of saying they've put on His righteousness. So there are a lot more. I mean, I could play this tune all night. A lot more of these. But these six demonstrate that whenever the Bible talks about baptism, 
it refers to it as a necessary part in the process of salvation along with faith. We could say that faith is expressed biblically through baptism. And it is at baptism we are saved because it is there that our sins are removed and that we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, one thing I want to mention, I'm looking here and I'm, I'm seeing people who are already Christians and many have been baptized for years, decades even. But remember, just, just reading these scriptures with someone uh, in, in a 30 minute period and, and if you're fortunate having the opportunity to explain it clearly to them and so doesn't mean that they take all this in. Remember I said the longest trip is from here to here. That's why I say that the, uh, the uh, salvation is a process. It's a process over time. A lot of people feel their repentance very strongly but yet their faith is very weak because they don't know a lot yet. You know, they've had a wild life and a very sinful life and just, just the mere, you, know, you just expose them to a little bit of Bible and it convicts them you know I mean, down to their toes. You know? So you know, the, the part about believe and repent, and be baptized, confess Christ and baptize, you know, sometimes it's the repentance that's strong at first. They don't know a whole lot about the Bible, but boy, are they sorry for what they've done. And other people, you know, they get it, they get it intellectually, they understand it, but it's taken a little time for them to understand that they are sinners, that they're really lost. And a lot of times those people put off baptism because they don't think they need it, because they think, well, I'm pretty good. I get this Christianity stuff, yeah, it's good, you know, but I'm, I'm a good person. As I said to you a couple of weeks ago, I said, most of us don't realize how sinful we really are. So it's a process and I'm saying that's why we have to be patient with people. It, it, it takes time for them to assimilate all this information. Even if you've managed to give it over to them in a half hour, it doesn't mean that they've been able to absorb it all. You might have to repeat the whole thing. <laughs> you know what happens a lot? So you've worked really hard, you've had four or five Bible studies, you know, whatever, and you've really explained it and answered all the questions and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you get a call three weeks later and from you know, Johnny, let's call him Johnny. He says, hey, I just want to tell you, you know, I was baptized last night. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was talking to sister so-and-so and I never understood that baptism was by him. And you're going, you know. <laughs> I told you 19 times I explained that to you. It's okay. Sometimes the, the information has got to come from another source. All right, I want to answer a couple of other questions here that are from the general doctrine area but have to do with what we've already been talking about. So here's the question. How can we prove that Jesus was immersed when He was baptized? Well, we can do that in three ways. First, we can explain that John's baptism was based on the Old Testament law of purification which required priests to wash their entire bodies with water before they put on their vestments in the service of the temple. It was a purification rite. Uh, Leviticus 8.6, then Moses had Aaron and his sons come near and wash them with water. So the Jews were very familiar with water purification rites. They understood the symbolism of water and its use not only in cleaning the body, but also in its symbolism in cleaning and purifying the, uh, the soul. Now when Jesus, another way, when Jesus was baptized, Mark uh, writes that He came up out of the water. It says here, immediately coming up out of the water, He saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon Him. I mean, if he were sprinkled with water, or had a little bit of water poured on his head, he would not have had to go down into the water with John the Baptist and then come out of the water. Same thing with the Philip and the eunuch. There's water, they went down into the water, they came up out of the water. But the strongest proof is the word that the Bible uses to describe what happened to Jesus in the water. 
The word that the writers used was the Greek word baptizo, which meant to plunge or to immerse. If you're writing a book in the Greek and you said that the woman was uh, you know, washing her dishes, well, they used the word baptizo. She was, bap she was baptizing their dishes because it means to plunge or to immerse. Now there were other Greek words that could have been used to specifically describe the sprinkling with water. Just like in English, you have the word immerse, which means to submerge something, right? But you also have another word called sprinkle, which means you just kind of sprinkle water. Well, in the Greek, they have that as well. The word rantizo means to sprinkle. And just like in English, we have the word pour, which is different than sprinkle or immerse, in the Greek, they also have another word for pour, ekcheo, which means to pour. Okay? So um, the word used by the Bible writers every time was the word baptizo. So how do we know that baptism is by immersion? Because the Greek word meant to immerse. All right. and, and, and the church, the early church for a thousand years, you know, immersed people. It's only when the doctrine of original sin developed by Augustine, the Catholic Church, you know, began to teach that people are inherently evil when they're born because they inherit, the, you know, they inherit evil from their, from their ancestors. They began teaching this idea. Well, the problem there is, well, what do you do with these evil babies? They're born with sin. They're guilty of sin when they're born. What if they die before they're old enough to you know, hear the gospel and you know, be saved? And so you know, in computers, you, know, you get a patch. So they got themselves a patch. It was called infant baptism. And then somebody said, well, wait a minute, you know, the little babies, you know, they, can't, they, they can't believe. You know. uh, oh, oh, we got to get another patch. And the patch they got was, well, we're using the faith of their parents. <laughs> the faith of their parents stands in for their faith. Yeah, but well, wait a minute, well, what about that kid? You know, I mean, how, how does he know what it was? We need another patch. It's called confirmation. And so when you're 12 years old, there's a ceremony where you go and um, you confirm that you accept what has happened to you as a baby. So in Catholic you know, church, I remember as a kid, when you're six years old, you get first communion, you do your first communion. And then when you're 11 or 12 years old, you go and receive confirmation. And confirmation, the ceremony for confirmation, usually the bishop is there, a higher ranking a cleric is there. And uh, we used to go, well, there was the ceremony, and then in the ceremony, the priest, you know, when he would do his homily, which is a sermon, but they call it a homily, um, he, would, he would say, you know, confirmation, you're confirming that you believe and that well, you, know, you are a, a Catholic and you confirm your baptism, and you promise when you're 12, you promise you'll never drink alcohol, you'll never smoke cigarettes, you'll never have uh, you know, improper sexual relations, you won't swear, and, and at 12 years old, I, I, yeah, I said, sure, I'm in. <laughs> and then we marched up to the front, and the bishop, this is so, I mean, And then the bishop would put his hand on your head or put his hand on your shoulder and that's when you received the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because the minute you change this, you got to have a patch. Because the minute you change it, well, something goes, oh, oh, whoop, it's like an octopus, whoop, something's sticking out, you know, whoop, 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 we got to patch that one. Then we, then we make up another doctrine to patch that. So in a variety of ways, you can show that Jesus was immersed in the Jordan when he was baptized. And this is the way that he and then his apostles and others performed the act of baptism for the very same reason, as I say, for a thousand years until we began you know, doctrines contrary to what the Bible teach. And we had to invent rituals in order to match the doctrines. Now what's interesting is that archeologists uh, and uh, Brother Coyle, you, if you've read that book, you probably uh, read that. 
um, archaeologists uh, who have kind of found the remains of early church buildings. You know, when I mean early, I don't mean like 1929. I mean you know, early, you know, 50 AD and 110 AD. And when they, when they clear away the rubble, what do they find in these early Christian church buildings? Baptistries, deep baptistries for immersion purposes. Steps going down, beautiful tiles decorated, the tiles were decorated, they had fish symbols or cross symbols or grape. Usually the symbols, early church was a cross, grapes representing the wine, bread, the spirit, fire, you know, all decorated, beautiful. And, and the amazing thing is they all had them. They all had them. They all had these walk-in baptistries. Well, why? Well, because they, they baptized by immersion. Okay, so that's how you can answer that question. Another question, harder one, when is forgiveness applied? When is forgiveness applied? Where is the point of grace? This is another way of saying at what precise moment are we forgiven? At what precise moment are we considered covered by the grace of God? Again, this takes us back to the point of salvation. Where, where exactly is the moment in time that we are saved? Well, Roman Catholics claim that it is when the little baby is baptized by a priest. Most evangelicals and Protestants say that it is at the moment when a person believes as true the claims of Christ and they accept Him as Savior. More radical uh, Calvinists say, well, you're saved when God chooses you. Because in Calvinism, God chooses those who are saved and He rejects those. So you don't have a choice. But that's radical Calvinism. We, in the churches of Christ, we believe that the Bible teaches that there is a dividing line between saved and lost. And that dividing line is baptism. Now the same scripture references that teach that baptism is a necessary response to the offer of salvation, those same scriptures also teach that in a time continuum, baptism is also the point at which we are saved. For example, what does it say in Mark 16? Those who believe and are baptized, they are the ones who are saved. John 3, 5, you must be born again, the water and the spirit. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized. Now, the argument that people make when this is explained is that by making baptism, which is a physical act, by making baptism the point of salvation, you are going back to a works system rather than a grace system. As a matter of fact, the thing that the churches of Christ are attacked most on, other than you guys think you're the only ones going to heaven, is that you preach a gospel of works. In other words, baptism is like a work of the law and no one will be saved through works of the law. Because Paul says in 3.20, because by works of the law no flesh will be justified. That's the argument against what we teach. Those who make this point misunderstand both how grace operates and what exactly is a work of the law. Grace is God's kindness and mercy in offering us salvation through faith in Christ rather than salvation through perfect law keeping or no salvation at all. You know, God could have said, you know what, these people, they're more trouble than they're worth. I'll just let them you know, go on their merry way. They'll end up killing themselves. They'll destroy themselves, destroy the earth. Good riddance. I'll create something else. He could have done that. Or he could have said, okay, I'll tell you what, you live the perfect life, come straight to heaven. Just obey the law, just obey me all the time, you come to heaven. He could have done that. But what did he do? No, he based salvation on faith. He said, if you believe and trust in me to save you, you'll be with me forever. So grace is God's kindness and mercy in offering us salvation through faith in Christ rather than no salvation at all or salvation through perfect works. 
a work of the law is any attempt to atone for our sins or achieve righteousness without reference to Christ. Baptism is not a work of the law because in no way is it an attempt to atone for sin or an act to achieve righteousness or right standing with God. You had an abortion, you had nine abortions. Who pays for that? That moral failure, you, you, you and your nine abortions. Yeah, Jesus pays for that. He atones for that on the cross. He makes payment for that. You're married nine times and divorced and remarried nine times? Who, 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 who pays the moral debt that you've accrued because of your much married life? Yeah, Jesus pays for that on the cross. You, you don't pay like 10% of it by doing your best and never having an abortion ever again. You know, that, that's 10% and then Jesus pays 90%. No, that's wrong. No, no he pays 100%, 100% of the moral uh, debt for all of your sins. And a work of the law is when you're trying to do something to try to pay a portion of that. That's a work of the law. Is the hardest thing to accept is God's grace. Why? Because we want to chip in. <laughs> okay, Lord, look, you've done so much. Let me, you know, let me leave the tip at least. You know, let me do something. No, you do nothing. What does Isaiah say? Yeah, your righteousness are like filthy rags. Wow, that's pretty harsh. The only act that atones for all sin is the cross of Jesus Christ. And He Himself bore our sins in His, He didn't say some of our sins or the worst of our sins. He bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by His wounds you were healed. The only act that produces total righteousness or makes us acceptable before God is the act of faith. Romans 3.28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. As a member of the church, don't ever be afraid to say to someone, we believe that we're saved by faith. Absolutely, the Bible teaches that we're saved by faith. Baptism is the physical act that expresses our faith. We're not being baptized to pay for our sins. Jesus paid for our sins. I'm being baptized to show that I believe, that I accept God's terms to be saved on the basis of faith. Okay, Lord, how do I show you that I believe? Be baptized. Repent of your sins. God has always required a physical response to demonstrate or to confirm conscious faith. Adam and Eve, how were they to express their faith in God? They were to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Noah, how did he express in faith his, his faith in God? He built the boat. What if Noah would have said, I hear you God, but nah, yeah, really, seriously, a flood? Come on, we haven't had rain here in two years. He built the boat. Abraham, so many, in Abraham's life, he left Ur, he circumcised his son, he offered his son. Jesus, how did he express his faith? The human Jesus, he went to the cross. The apostles and all the disciples since then, how do we express our faith? Baptism, is that the only time we express our faith? Of course not, of course not. But that expression of faith is what puts us into the body of Christ. Almost done here. The main dispute over this issue is this. Evangelical and others claim that the act of faith is mental assent to the gospel. I decide that I believe and I say, come into my heart, Jesus. They, that's an act. And they say, that's the expression of faith. We in the churches of Christ believe that the Bible teaches 
that baptism is the act or the response of faith at which point a person receives the benefits of faith, which is salvation. Acts 22, 16, what does he say? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on His name. The calling on His name, what is that? That's your faith. Isn't it amazing? Paul has, as I said before, seen the miracle, he's heard the gospel, he accepts that Jesus whom he formerly persecuted is truly the Messiah, and yet with this belief and insight Ananias still says to him, and now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized. He believed, he accepted as true, but he was still unforgiven of his sins until he expressed his faith, here's the point, in the way that God requires it. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. The Bible teaches us that the acceptable response of faith is repentance and baptism. Peter says it this way, one last passage. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, not a purification rite, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the point of forgiveness, the separation from death to life in the waters of baptism. Again, Romans, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Remember I said, where's the dividing line? Well, Romans says it right there, death, life, in the waters about. You go in and you die, you come out and you're alive. There's the dividing line, right there. So we go from death to life in the waters of baptism. Uh, and fairly easy to uh, demonstrate uh, using the scriptures, using the scriptures. Okay, that's it. Sorry, went a little over time. Thank you very much.